Hello, this is John, and welcome to the real world as we are seeking truth daily together. We're going to take a listen to Julian Assange when he gave his last live feed shortly before he was arrested. And it's towards the end here that it's very important that you hear this because he was cut, his communications were cut. And what you're about to hear is going to amaze you. But we also got to take a listen to what the CIA director John Brennan said back in 2016 when he was still CIA director, right after what you hear Julian Assange say, because today I noticed the skies were lined out with white lines. You can't say the magic word, but uh, the CIA director at the time was referring to that it as upper atmospheric aerosol injections. But what he did not tell you is they had nanoparticles of aluminum and barium. And aluminum and barium are heavy metals. And heavy metals in your system are not good for the human immune system, nor are they good for the human brain, for they are, are proven to cause Alzheimer's. And they have found that Alzheimer patients have high concentrates of heavy metals in their brain. So let's listen to what Julian Assange has to say. And then we're going to listen to John Brennan. And then we're going to go and listen and see why President Trump did not pardon Julian Assange. He wanted to, but there is a reason why he didn't. And then we're going to go listen to what John Brennan said today in regards to rounding up people that support President Trump. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Julian Assange from September 20. 2018 that we have by principally commercial organizations trying to harvest our interactions with the world that's that's the um yeah that's the principal economic model that all these ai companies have had and the traditional uh, surveillance uh, capitalism companies have had and the 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 number of degrees of interaction so what do I mean by that? Um, so if you, if you kind of imagine a space of interactions, the, the number of types of interaction, the frequencies of interaction between you and everything else in the space is dramatically in, uh, increasing. And in a way you can consider each one of these degrees of freedom is, is kind of like a triangulation. So to triangu triangulate something in a two dimensional space, well, okay, you just need Two, two directions, uh, two signals, directional signals. Uh, but we are giving off, uh, if someone has used using a mobile phone, for example, we're probably giving off a couple of hundred of these on average per second. Some, something like that. Maybe not, maybe not quite as, maybe, okay, maybe, maybe a dozen, perhaps. Uh, although if you do video, of course, there's vast, vast amounts more. So anyway, between dozens and, and hundreds of um, measurements, we are emanating constantly. And so if you click those together, you can effectively triangulate someone's uh, activities and behavior. And I don't think by chopping out uh, many of them or adding uh, kind of chaff, uh, cover, you can make that much make that much of a difference, and increasingly, increasingly it's less. Um, and the, in terms of the Internet of Things, there's research prototypes now, which I assume are being used by uh, intelligence agencies, of very small electronic circuits uh, that you can just put in paper or put and paint or on the on the walls. Uh, that are, pa are powered by the GSM stations and they they operate as the GSM radio wave passes through them. It gives them enough power for a very small amount of time to do things. So obviously that tendency is going to continue. It's not the, like the internet of things. It's, it's uh, if you like, uh, intelligent evil dust uh, scattered everywhere like, like confetti in everything. So I think it's, increasingly hard for human beings to work out how to deal with that and and the only way i the only way i can see is that as 
that we've got to securitize this problem. Computer security industry is, is, you know, it's been engaged in outrageous securitization for a very long period of time, hyping up threats, et cetera. I get how the game is played. Uh, it needs to be securitized in a different way. We need to securitize the, by securitize I mean you turn something into a threat and thereby change behavior or get economic gain from it. Um, so we need to securitize the threat to elites by these developments. The people who run these companies, it's a threat to them. It's a, it's, a, it's a threat to the most powerful people in society. And to eliminate the notion that there's a place that powerful people can hide from or skilled people can hide from this phenomenon. Uh, and that's the way to get uh, all those people who have an ability to make a difference to make a difference. And right after he said that, the live feed was cut. Now, remember what he said about intelligent evil dust. Let's listen to what John Brennan had to say. Some of the world's leading economies and even the lesser economies could face even stronger headwinds from having significantly larger proportions of retired people and older people relative to working age citizens. Another example is the array of technologies, often referred to collectively as geoengineering, that potentially could help reverse the warming effects of global climate change. One that has gained my personal attention is stratospheric aerosol injection, or SAI. A method of seeding the stratosphere with particles that can help reflect the sun's heat in much the same way that volcanic eruptions do. An SAI program could limit global temperature increases, reducing some risks associated with higher temperatures and providing the world economy additional time to transition from fossil fuels. This process is also relatively inexpensive. The National Research Council estimates that a fully deployed SAI program would cost about $10 billion yearly. As promising as it may be, moving forward on SAI would also raise a number of challenges for our government and for the international community. On the technical side, greenhouse gas emission reductions would still have to accompany SAI to address other climate change effects, such as ocean acidification, because SAI alone would not remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. On the geopolitical side, the technology's potential to alter weather patterns and benefit certain regions of the world at the expense of other regions could trigger sharp opposition by some nations. Now, also note that Biden got us back into the Paris Climate Accord where we have to lower our carbon footprint here in the United States. And it is interesting how he is talking about this to combat climate change. But understand, he didn't mention uh, barium or aluminum nanoparticles that are in these aerosols, which is the reflective material which falls to the ground, and it causes the ground and the waters and the streams to heat up. And, it's, it, and it seems like it was in uh, full motion going today in my area of the world. Now let's listen to what John Brennan said today. And as you understood that Julian Assange talked about this uh, intelligent evil dust being a way to track people and what they do. On the call, I was thinking today that uh, this is the most relaxed I've been uh, in the course of many inaugurations I've watched because I'm not responsible for it. But I can tell you that when I was in the government, I was I had white knuckles because yeah. of the nature of the threats. But it's so much more difficult today because of what we have seen, not just over the last two weeks, but that certainly has riveted our attention. But because of this growth in polarization in the United States and domestic violence in white supremacist groups. So I know looking forward that the members of the, the Biden team team who have been nominated or have been appointed are now moving in laser-like fashion to try to uncover as much as they can about what looks very similar to insurgency movements that we've seen overseas, mm -hmm. where they germinate in different parts of a country and they gain strength and it brings together an unholy alliance frequently of religious, ex religious extremists, authoritarians, fascists, bigots, uh, racists, nativists, uh, even libertarians. And unfortunately, I think there has been this momentum that has been generated as a result of, unfortunately, the demagogic rhetoric of people that's just departed government. 
but also those who continue in the halls of Congress. And so I really do uh, think that the law enforcement, homeland security, intelligence, and even the defense officials are doing everything possible to root out what seems to be a very, very serious and insidious threat to our democracy and our republic. Anybody else notice that he had a hard time breathing? Well, you could hear it every time he inhaled. But am I kind of thinking that they all want to round up anybody that supported Trump? That would help him out in the next election. I mean, that's just kind of scary talk, what this guy was saying. Anyone that uh, supported Trump, you know, uh, you know, they've got the mainstream media out there convincing everybody that anybody that supported Trump was a fascist and that they're just terrible people. But, you know, people that supported Trump were constitutionalists. So let's go and listen to why President Donald J. Trump did not pardon Julian Assange. So in last night's show and on previous shows, we've told you about the cases of two men, Julian Assange and John Karakou. Julian Assange is a kind of international journalist. John Kirikou is a former CIA officer. We should be totally blunt and tell you we're not sure we share the politics of either man. But both of their cases tell you something really important about what's going on in this country, about what matters, and about what the people in charge would like to prevent you from doing. Julian Assange and John Kirikou both went to jail for telling the truth. Neither one stole classified documents from the U.S. government. Neither one of them hacked into anything. Julian Assange told you a lot about what the U.S. government was doing abroad and told you everything about what the DNC was doing to rig its own primaries back in 2016. Remember the WikiLeaks dump? You know about that because of Julian Assange. And by the way, if you're a Bernie Sanders voter, assuming any of those watching tonight, you probably were glad to know that. Everyone else was lying to you. Julian Assange brought you information that you had a right to know. John Karakou, meanwhile, told the truth about what our military and our intel agencies were doing during the Iraq war. Again, you may not agree with his position, but what he said was true. And that matters above all because truth is and must be a defense. If you say something true, you shouldn't be punished because we should value truth above all. In both cases, those men went to prison. And in both cases tonight, as one of his final acts as president, Donald Trump has the opportunity to make that right, to pardon both of them. We told you that last night. We told you it before. We're hearing tonight that neither man, particularly Julian Assange, we don't know if this is true, is likely to get a pardon. Why? Well, apparently, because Republicans in the Senate, and by Republicans in the Senate, we mean Mitch McConnell of Kentucky, the leader of Republicans in the Senate, has sent word over to the White House, if you pardon Julian Assange, we are much more likely to convict you in an impeachment trial. Now, is it legal to hold that over a president's head? We're not lawyers. We don't know. It's certainly wrong. But more than that, it tells you everything about their priorities. At a time when this country in some ways is coming apart, we're at a pivot point in American history. And if you're watching this show, you probably feel pretty threatened, and for good reason. There are people on the other channel saying they're going to hunt you down like a terrorist. At that moment, what is Mitch McConnell, your designated defender in the United States Senate, worrying about? He's worrying about protecting the uniparty in Washington, not his party, his party and the Democratic Party in permanent Washington. They're the reason both these men have been locked up, because both these men embarrassed permanent Washington. That's their crime. And his priority in the final hours of the Trump administration is to make certain that they remain punished for doing that. It tells you everything. We don't know what's going to happen in the end. We've got a number of hours left for the president to make that decision. But we want you to know how that decision is being made because it's deeply revealing. Now, understand, it's very important you understand the reason that Julian Assange was demonized by the established politicians of Washington, D.C. and the mainstream media networks and social online media companies is because he gave a safe haven for whistleblowers because Julian Assange never revealed a whistleblower's name. Everything was kept confidential and he even went to prison uh, because of that. Now, you eliminate a safe haven for whistleblowers 
the swamp can get deeper and wider and the, the oligarchs that are controlling not just the United States but the world for that matter know that they won't be revealed to the people of the world that but their own actions are starting to show that what everybody says doesn't exist is there and it's deep it's wide and it is long now I'm gonna close this video out with a video of President Donald J. Trump before he was president and what he did that will prove to you that he was not or he is not or ever has been racist as he helped build the Rainbow Coalition and he took money out of his own pocket to do so. Presence there. Uh, and uh, beyond that, in terms of reaching out and being inclusive, he's done that too. Uh, and created for many people a comfort zone when I ran for the presidency uh, in 84 and 88. And many others uh, thought it was either laughable or something to avoid. He came to our business meeting here in New York because he has this sense of the curious and a will to risk to make things better. And so aside from all of, of his style, uh, and his um, pizzazz, he's a serious person who is an effective builder of building for the builder of people. Last year, he was a part of our workshop, of our panel workshop on what are the challenges and opportunities. And so this, a year later, Donald Trump, uh, for a few minutes, challenges and opportunities to embrace the underserved communities. Donald Trump. Well, it is an honor to be here, and uh, I was with Jesse last year, and we had a lot of fun, and it was a little different. We had a real panel where you asked questions and everything, and we didn't do so much speaking, so I'm going to get off here very quickly, because I want to hear some questions. <laughs> and I loved, I was just telling Roger, he had an expression last year, the wall on wall must fall. And you haven't used it today, and I'm very disappointed in this, Jesse, because I thought it was a great expression. And I heard the expression about 14 times, and then he came to me at the end of the session, and he said, listen, I want some office space in your building on Wall Street, because the wall on wall will fall. <laughs> and I said, it's okay, Jesse, I'll make a good deal with you. I'll get you some space. You'll pay about $40 a foot. And he said, no, no, no. I don't want to pay 40. He said, how about 30? No. It was the cheapest deal I ever made in the history of 40 Wall Street, is that right? <laughs> He got it for nothing. <laughs> He's a very tough negotiator. We know that, right? Nah, he's a terrific guy. We love him, and I'm here for him. And the snow came, and I said, gee, nobody's going to show up, and look at this place. It's packed.